Good morning, everybody. Last week we talked about Epaphroditus, one of those lesser known saints. And some of these lesser known saints have a lot to teach us. And because most of us will probably never have ministries like Paul, Peter, John, although maybe some of us will, uh, these lesser known saints can be examples to us. You know, we can identify with them. And these are people we can be and should be like. A few weeks ago, we talked for a couple weeks from 2 Timothy chapter 3 about how in the last days, men would become, what, lovers of self, lovers of money, lovers of pleasure, and there's probably about another 20 words that kind of describe the people in the last days. And But in contrast to those, these lesser known saints are great people for us to imitate because they are just the opposite of being lovers of self. They are people who, who uh, are willing to sacrifice their lives for one another. So today, I want to mention, fairly briefly, a few others. And the first one I want to mention is a man named Epaphras. And let's go to Colossians chapter 1. And in Paul's introduction, he actually gives a pretty uh, good description of him. Let's start in verse 5. Because of the hope laid up for you in heaven, of which you previously heard in the word of truth, the gospel which has come to you, just as in all the world also it is constantly bearing fruit and increasing, even as it has been doing in you since the day you heard of it and understood the grace of God in truth, just as you learned it from Epaphras, our beloved fellow bondservant who is a faithful servant of Christ on your behalf. And he has informed us of your love in the Spirit. Okay, so look how Paul refers to him, our fellow, our beloved fellow bondservant, our faithful servant in Christ. And he was responsible for teaching the church at Colossae the gospel, the grace of God. It was through Epaphras, according to Paul, that they understood the grace of God. And by the way, that's something a lot of people in churches today don't have a good understanding of, is the grace of God. So Epaphras was somehow able to communicate, was able to impart the grace of God to the people of Colossae. And the result was that what? They were known for bearing fruit and for increasing, for growing. I mean, what a testimony. Do we need men and women like that today? May we have many people like Epaphras who can teach and impart the grace of God, the gospel to people. But note that first of all, he was a bondservant. The Greek word there is doulos. He was a bondservant, and out of that flowed his ability to communicate or to impart the gospel and the grace of God. There's a lot of things we don't know about Epaphras, but we do know that he was a part of the church at Colossae. Maybe some say he was one of the founding leaders there. We don't know. Colossians 4, 12 and 13, let's kind of find out a little bit more about him. Epaphras, who is one of your number, a bond slave of Jesus Christ, sends you his greetings always laboring earnestly for you in his prayers, so that you may stand perfect and fully assured in all the will of God. For I testify for him that he has a deep concern for you and for those who are in Laodicea and Aeropolis. Now, so a couple other things we know about him. You know, one is that... Um, Epaphras was obviously with Paul at this time because he says, you know, Epaphras sends his greeting. He was a bond slave of Jesus Christ. Again, a doulos. And get this, he was always laboring earnestly for them in their prayers. Three big words there. Always laboring. In other words, there's a fight. He wasn't just, it wasn't something passive he was doing. And he was doing it earnestly. He was praying for them. And it wasn't just a vague prayer either, was it? It was something specific. It says he was praying that they might stand perfect or literally stand mature 
and be fully assured in all the will of God. I'll tell you what, I wish people like that would pray for me that way. And that's what we need to be praying for one another that way. So he was a prayer warrior too, wasn't he? And maybe that had something to do with his ability to impart the grace of God. Uh, it also says in these verses that he has a deep concern for all of you for, and for the saints in two other cities that were located near Colossus. So he must have been involved. I mean, he, at least he knew the people there. He you know, had visited with them. And uh, so, you know, he was, a, he, was, he was one of these lesser known saints that was having an impact, you know, in at least three cities. The churches in three cities and he had this ability to impart the gospel and ability to impart the grace of God and because of that the church at Colossae was flourishing he was a prayer warrior Philemon verse 23 he's mentioned again just very briefly but let me kind of get it it says Epaphras my fellow prisoner in Christ Jesus greets you so by the time that Philemon was written, Paul was a prisoner, and Epaphras was also. For what? We don't know. Probably, you know, for, for teaching or preaching the gospel, the grace of God. So Epaphras is one of those lesser-known saints that we should want to be one and imitate. He's got a lot to teach us. Then there's Phoebe. Okay, let's go to... Romans chapter 16. In fact, Romans chapter 16 is probably one of the, uh, includes probably one of the larger numbers of uh, these lesser known saints. But let's kind of read it. I commend to you our sister Phoebe, who is a servant of the church, which is at Centria, that you receive her in the manner, in the Lord, in a manner worthy of the saints. And that you help her in whatever she may ask, have need of you. For she herself has been a helper of many and of myself as well. Now, this is the only time that we read about Phoebe. Uh, what do we know about her? She was a woman. She was a sister in the Lord. She was a servant at the church in Centria. And that word servant literally means a deaconess. And... Uh, by the way, Centria was a city, it was a port seat at city right outside of Corinth. She had responsibilities there in the church. We don't know exactly what, but she was a helper. She was a servant. Uh, we don't know her exact responsibilities. But we do believe that Paul sent his letter of Romans to the church at Rome through her because of the way, you know, because of the way the wording is right there. But he says, receive her in the Lord in a manner worthy of the saints. Help her in whatever she needs. And it's kind of interesting. He says, he tells the people in Rome, you know, help her in whatever she needs because she's helped a lot of other people. Again, we don't know the details, but she must have had some responsibilities once she got to Rome. She had helped a lot of people, including Paul, and people were saying, okay, anything that she needs, give her a helping hand. You know, in this chapter, Paul mentions many of these lesser known saints. They are, as we said last week, they're the backbone of the church. And out of all the people he mentions, he mentions her first. That's significant. I mean, wouldn't it, sometimes I kind of think, wouldn't it be great to have some of these lesser known saints come and visit us and we could ask them all sorts of questions? Well, of course, that's not going to happen. But there will be a day where when we're all gathered around the throne of God, that we will be able to meet some of these people and hopefully hear some of their stories in more detail. For now, we have to be content with just knowing just a little bit, the brief descriptions, but the brief descriptions we're given tell us these are mighty men and women of God. By the way, some critics of Christianity try to make a point that women are not very well respected in the church. Really, that's not really true. And actually, those people didn't read Romans 16 because at least six women are mentioned in these lesser known, uh, uh, among these, the, these lesser known saints here in this chapter. And, uh, and Christianity, 
probably more than any other institution or any other movement made or recognized women with respect and honor like really no other movement has. It led the way for the rest of civilization. Phoebe is someone that we all want to imitate, whether we're men or women. And I like the way he kind of starts off. He says, I commend to you our sister Phoebe. In other words, he's saying, listen, here is someone that I want you to honor and respect and learn from. May the Lord give us many Phoebes in the church today. Okay, then there's Priscilla and Achilla. In fact, we just kind of keep reading in Romans 16. We can kind of read a little bit about it. Meet Presca. By the way, Presca was the formal name for Priscilla. Every other place, I think that it's uh, that uh, Priscilla is mentioned, it uses her nickname, which is Priscilla. So, Greek Priscilla and Achilla, my fellow workers in Christ Jesus, who for my life risk their own nets, to whom no, not only do I give thanks, but also all the churches of the Gentiles. Okay, here he calls them fellow workers. They risked their net for Paul. Again, we don't know the details. And I, I guess it really doesn't make any difference. Probably one day, when we're again, when we're all around the throne of God, maybe we'll find out a little bit about their story. We do know some things. We do know that they were from Rome originally. They were run out of town as refugees during the persecution of Jews while Claudius was emperor. They continued to preach the gospel wherever they went. Ended up in a number of cities. We'll kind of mention a few of them in a few minutes. They met Paul. They traveled with Paul for a while. And now they're back in Rome. And a church met in their home in Rome. And it implies in a couple of different places that they risked their lives, perhaps on several occasions, for other believers. Let's go to Acts 18. We find out a little bit more about who Priscilla and Aquila were. Acts 18. Uh, let's kind of start in verse 2. 2 and 3 first. Okay, so Paul's gone to Corinth, and he found a Jew named Aquila, a native of Pontus having recently come from Italy with his wife Priscilla, because Claudius, we'd already mentioned this, had commanded all the Jews to leave Rome. He came to them, and because he was of the same trade, he stayed with them, and they were working, for by trade they were tent makers. Okay, so uh, we know that Paul stayed with them, lived with them, he made tents with them, and, um, and then let's kind of go to verses 18 and 19. It says, Paul, having remained many days longer, took leave of the brethren and went out to sea for Syria. And with him were Priscilla and Achilla. In Centria, he had, he had his hair cut, for he was keeping a vow. They came to Ephesus, and he left them there. Now he himself entered the synagogue and reasoned with the Jews. Okay, so what do we know? Uh, well, we can already can tell they were in Corinth, then they were in Centria. And then they were in Ephesus. So they were traveling around with Paul, at least at this stage. And then in the uh, same chapter, verses 24, they were in uh, Ephesus at the time. Now a Jew named Apollos, an Alexandrian by birth, an eloquent man, came to Ephesus, and he was mighty in the scriptures. By the way, he would be one of those other lesser known saints, but we won't talk about him today. This man had been instructed in the way of the Lord, and being fervent in spirit, he was speaking and teaching accurately the things concerning Jesus, being acquainted only with the baptism of John. So Apollos, he was a mighty man in the scriptures. He was fervent in spirit. He was teaching accurately. And, um, you know, uh, the things concerning Jesus. And he began to speak out boldly in the synagogue, verse 26. But when Priscilla and Achilla heard him, they took him aside and explained to him the way of God more accurately. Now, this is kind of an uh, interesting story here. Uh, one thing it shows is that Priscilla and Achilla were strong in God's word. They were mighty in the scriptures, too, because they even took 
Apollos, who was mighty in the scriptures, under their wing. They were gentle. They were able to win the trust of Apollos because someone who's mighty in the scriptures, it's kind of hard for them just to be corrected. But they were able to correct and admonish Apollos. And by the way, that's a rare gift to be able to do that and it be received. So they had to be mighty in the scriptures as well. First uh, Corinthians 16, 19, we won't go there, but just want to say that, uh, um, that it was written in Ephesus and it refers to the church that was meeting in their house in Ephesus, in the house of Priscilla and Achilles. So here they are, they've got a, a, a church there going. And then in 2 Timothy, let's do turn there, 2 Timothy chapter 4, verse 19, we see Greek Priscilla and Achilla and the household of Onis, Onesiphorus. And here, this was, uh, he was writing it to Timothy. Timothy was in Ephesus, so they're still in Ephesus. Presumably, they're still involved in leading a church or they're involved in teaching, preaching, discipling. Now, it's obvious that these two were very important to Paul and to a number of churches. Paul lives with them for a while. Everywhere they are, we see them ministering to people. We don't know much about their public ministry, but we do know that they were excellent disciples. disciples. They were part of the backbone of this early church. And we know that churches in Rome, in Ephesus, maybe in Corinth, they had they were, um, they were involved in some type of leadership there. One of the questions, of course, if you, if you start doing a study on Achilla and Priscilla, there's all sorts of questions. One of the questions is, why is Priscilla usually mentioned before Achilla? Not always, but most of the time. Well, we don't know. Some people have speculated she came to the Lord before him. You know, and maybe that's why they named it that way. Maybe she was known as a great teacher among them. We don't know. What we do know is that they are the first known ministry team, husband and wife, ministering together, mentioned in the church. And they should be examples for really all married couples. They worked together, and they had the ability, obviously, to complement one another in their ministries. Priscilla is, and if you read anything about her, this always comes up, she's mentioned as a candidate for writing the book of Hebrews. Why? Well, because there's no author mentioned in Hebrews, that was very rare in those days. And uh, so those who promote the idea that Priscilla was perhaps the writer say, well, you know, it'd probably be only natural if she wrote it. We know that she and her husband are pretty mighty in the scriptures. And Hebrews is definitely, you have to know the scriptures to be able to write Hebrews. And that maybe she wanted to remain anonymous. But, you know, really, we really don't know. And when God doesn't tell us some things, it's usually for a reason. And I know for me, I'm content with not knowing. But Priscilla and Achilla are two more lesser-known saints that we should imitate and learn from. Okay, one more. And his name is Tachikas. And that is the way you're supposed to pronounce it. I looked it up. We don't know much about him, maybe even less than the others, but he is frequent, he's frequently mentioned in the scriptures. And it seems like he's everywhere. Let's look at, let's start with Colossians 4, verse 7. It says, As to all my affairs, Tachikas, our beloved brother and faithful servant and fellow bond servant in the Lord, wow, that's quite, quite a description, will bring you information. So he's a beloved brother. He's a faithful servant. He's a fellow bond servant, a doulos in the Lord. And he was entrusted with bringing some information, probably more personal details. He, it was obvious that he was trusted very much by Paul. Acts 20, he's also in the book of Acts, verse 4. And we might get a better glimpse of what he was involved in here. Let me just say it here. Uh, 20 verse 4, and it's talking about Paul, and it says, and he was accompanied by 
and excuse me for my pronunciation, I'm probably butchering a lot of these names. He was accompanied by Sapertur of Berea, the son of uh, Phyrus, and by Aristarchus and Segundus of the Thessalonians, and Gaius of Derbe, and Timothy, that's a pretty easy one, and Tachicus and Trophimus of Asia. So what do we know about him from this verse? He accompanied Paul in one of his ministry teams. He traveled around. He is from Asia, which by the way, uh, Asia Minor, that was a province of Rome uh, in the western part of present-day Turkey. Uh, so, so, we, so we know that. 2 Timothy chapter 4. And get here real quick. 2 Timothy chapter 4. Four, verse 12 it says but Tychicus I have sent to Ephesus so again he's pretty entrusted you know uh, he's trusted by Paul you know Paul says okay listen I need you to go to, um, to Ephesus now in fact if you even read uh, Ephesians the book of Ephesians he's of course mentioned there because he's there you know uh, verse 21 and 22 uh, it says in chapter 6, But that you also may know about my circumstances, how I'm doing Tychicus, the beloved brother and faithful minister to the Lord, will make everything known to you. I have sent him to you for this very purpose, so that you may know about us and that he may comfort your hearts. So the description there, beloved brother, faithful minister in the Lord, he was sent by Paul again. And for a purpose that he might comfort your hearts. In other words, he must have been an encourager. Because it seems like Paul's sending him everywhere. By the way, do you see a pattern here? These lesser known saints and many others, they were always working together, weren't they? They, were, uh, they worked, they traveled from city to city. They worked in teams all for the establishment of healthy churches. Paul was not alone. He surrounded himself with great brothers and sisters, servants, bond servants, and together they did the work of Christ. They changed the world. And, uh, and that is what I believe God wants to do in these days also. I see a day when God will have quite a few of us going from place to place, starting churches, bringing encouragement, teaching, making disciples, teams, working together. That's what God is doing and he wants to do. And so we have a lot to learn from these companions of Paul and some of the other apostles too. They were not lovers of self, were they? In fact, what are some of the characteristics that we see over and over as we've kind of looked at some of these? We see their faithfulness. They were faithful servants. They were uh, looking for ways to serve, and usually in ways that were unnoticed. You know, uh, we don't know what they, what they did in most cases, you know, but we know that they were extremely very, I mean, they're extremely valuable, right? They were bond servants. They were doulas. They were uh, giving themselves completely to the Lord. They were not lovers of self. They were praying. And just kind of, you know, getting back to Epaphras, you know, those three words that, is, that, that are used there, always laboring earnestly in his prayers for them. They were caring for others. That's pretty obvious. And they were rooted and established in the root of God. So in conclusion, we can learn a lot from these men and women. And ministry couples they exhibited godly character they worked together they preferred one another they risked their lives for one another and together the early church was established among the nations among the Gentiles it took bond servants faithful servants to do that who were willing to work together and to prefer one another and give themselves to the purposes of God. They are examples for us. Let's pray. Father, 
what can we say? We just feel inspired when we read uh, these brief descriptions of these lesser known saints. Lord, we pray, Lord, that here in Emmanuel Fellowship and throughout the world that you would raise up many Phoebes and Epherses and Priscilla's and Achilles and Tychicus's and Epaphroditus's and many of the others that are kind of mentioned. Lord, we pray that you would raise up teams of bond servants to go around preaching, teaching, making disciples, encouraging one another, serving, and doing it together. Lord, this is what the church, what I really believe that you're calling the church for in the, in the months and years ahead. But Lord, it, one thing is really clear. Every one of these men and women, they're mentioned as workers, as servants, as bond servants. Lord, make us bond servants for your kingdom. Thank you, Lord. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Well, thank you very much. Just again, just want to kind of remind you, especially those of you who are part of the Emmanuel Fellowship family, uh, if you'd like to support the ministry, which I know that most people in the Emmanuel Fellowship do, uh, you know, we encourage you to do so. Right now, during these crazy times, we are meeting uh, at the Dillon Theater in Dillon, a movie theater. We've got two services going on because we're limited. One's at 9.30, one's at 11. Uh, but we're probably still probably uh, getting more people watching us online than anywhere else. And uh, But, you know, best way to, to, to give support the ministry here is through the Emmanuel Fellowship app. You can do that. And or if you're happy to be one of the services, we do have the offering box there. Thank you so much. We really appreciate your joining us. And we just pray that God's blessing would be upon you in this coming week. Thank you.